Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, John, for that introduction. It's a great privilege um, to be here and a great pleasure to be here at the birth um, of the Democracy Unit, um, partly because I think there aren't enough units uh, in the world, and we're, we're the Constitution Unit. I was just thinking there's the Nudge Unit. They get quite a lot of press, um, but then there's, there's not many others. So having another unit uh, definitely adds to things. But um, obviously the, the more important word in that title is democracy. And as John has just said, um, there has been a lot of uh, debate and discussion about the state of democracy in the UK over the last few years. We've gone through rather a lot of politics uh, over the last three, four years, um, and that has led to huge tensions in, in how we think about democracy, uh, between different visions of democracy, um, uh, uh, and, and that's been played out, of course, uh, on the issue of Brexit, but has spilled over into a range of other issues as well. So, um, as John has indicated in the talk, I'm going to do pretty much what is in, what is in the title. I'm going to break with academic tradition in that respect. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so, essentially, four things are, are coming up. So, I'll start off by suggesting two visions of democracy that I think have been quite important uh, in debates around Brexit in the UK over the last few years. Then I'll quite bravely argue that one of them is better than the other. Uh, then thirdly, I'll argue that given that, as John was suggesting, um, that leads to the thought that there must be better processes through which we could conduct our democracy, uh, <coughs> particularly thinking about big uh, constitutional decisions. And then finally, I'll draw out the implications for just how democracy should be conducted in the UK. So starting off with uh, those two visions of democracy. So when we think about the debate about Brexit, um, and what people have said since the referendum about what should happen on Brexit. I think essentially we see, as I said, two visions. <clears throat> so one says voters were presented with two options in the referendum. They chose between those options. A majority of them expressed a preference for one of those options and therefore now it's the duty of the politicians to implement that option. End of story. That's all there is to the democratic process. Um, the other vision of democracy, by contrast, says, well, hang on, life's all just a little bit more complicated than that, actually. So voters, first of all, they were choosing between principles, between the principle of staying in the EU and the principle of leaving the EU. They weren't choosing between worked out versions of that, at least on the side of leaving the EU. It wasn't clear what form that might take. Um, some would also say that, uh, so, so, so it wasn't possible to make an informed choice between concrete options. Uh, some, some would also say that it wasn't even possible to make an informed choice between those principles uh, because there was a great deal of misinformation uh, during the campaign. Misinformation was on both sides, however. So anyway, <clears throat> this, this is the view. Um, that people weren't able to make an informed choice about uh, serious fleshed out options and therefore whether we should go ahead uh, with Brexit should at least be subject to very careful scrutiny. We should scrutinise with great care the particular form that Brexit should take um, and perhaps there should be another public vote uh, on these different options. These two ideas um, about what should happen on Brexit um, are underpinned by two competing visions of democracy, which I'm going to label with two very horrible long words, the plebiscitarian vision of democracy and the deliberative vision of democracy. So the plebiscitarian vision of democracy essentially says the voters from time to time are able to make a decision, they're able to choose between a number of alternatives, and once they have decided, that is what should happen. So that clearly relates to a referendum, when the uh, voters are given a choice between options in a referendum. It equally applies to an election. Voters choose between competing manifestos in the election, and once the election has taken place and a party has a majority, that party has the right to go ahead and implement its manifesto. Um, the, the deliberative vision of democracy, by contrast, again says, no, it's all just a bit more complicated than that. Um, uh, we can't just reduce uh, democracy to these kinds of very simple decisions, um, firstly because 
um, the process of coming to a view, of deciding how you're going to vote uh, in any of these votes um, is, is really important and we need to think about that process. And secondly, because these, these decisions them, in themselves are highly complex and we need to think them through and take them in stages and not suppose that we can have them just in one big bite. <clears throat> so we have these two competing visions. Uh, since I started um, planning for this uh, talk, the first of these visions, the plebiscitarian vision, has won in UK politics, at least for the time being. So the general election took place on the 12th of December, and that was very much an election that was a contest between these two visions of democracy. On the one side, we had uh, just get Brexit done, and also uh, various other proposals within the Conservative Party manifesto, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit, um, about streamlining, as they would say, government in order to ensure that the executive government can implement its policies. Um, while on the other hand, uh, we had various parties saying, no, we need to continue thinking about this, we need to have another referendum on Brexit. Um, so plebiscitarianism has won. Now, if you adopt a plebiscitarian vision of democracy, that's it. Plebiscitarian vision has won. We should all um, uh, think that that debate has been settled for the next five years. I'm going to argue, however, for a deliberative vision of democracy, according to which, uh, hang on, we should slow down. Just because they won the election doesn't mean that the debate ends at that point. Um, and we should actually continue thinking about the nature of de our democracy quite fundamentally. <clears throat> Um, and, of course, it's also worth noting that a majority of voters in the general election last month actually voted for parties that were advancing the deliberative vision of democracy, not the uh, plebiscitarian vision. So it's all a bit more complex than the plebiscitarian would have us believe. OK, so those are the two visions of Brexit uh, that I'm going to talk about. And sorry, of democracy that I'm going to talk about. Those, that's them applied to the question of Brexit. Now I'm going to try to abstract from Brexit and think about those visions as visions in themselves and argue that the deliberative vision on the whole uh, is better than the plebiscitarian vision. Now given what I've just said, it may be quite difficult to think about this uh, in abstraction from the Brexit debate. Um, <clears throat> But democracy is a pretty important thing, and I think we should try to think about uh, the value of democracy independently of whether we uh, support one or other side uh, on the Brexit debate. So, why the second vision, the deliberative vision, is, I think, better? I'm going to offer you five reasons uh, as to why <coughs> I think the deliberative vision of democracy makes more sense. So the first is just that informed decision-making generally leads to better outcomes. So if we think of decision-making in our own everyday lives, <coughs> we tend to think that before we make an important decision, we should become informed. We should work out what the options are that we're choosing between. Uh, and we should take some time just to be sure uh, that, that we've got it right um, before we make that decision. So as, as I said, we should care about the process of forming our opinion rather than just caring about whether our opinion prevails at the end of the process or not. <clears throat> Secondly, plebiscitarianism disempowers citizens. Um, now, that might seem a little bit paradoxical. The idea of plebiscitarianism is that the people should be in charge, and once they've made a decision, that is what should happen. Um, but to the extent that plebiscitarianism de-emphasizes the importance of pr the process of thinking through decisions carefully, I would argue that it does disempower citizens. Um, <clears throat> firstly, because... Uh, if we don't really think things through, think our decisions through very carefully, <coughs> then we know from all sorts of psychology research that our decisions will be shaped by uh, various psychological biases that we all have, that we have just because of the nature of our biology and how we've evolved uh, over the years. Um, so to some degree, we're giving power over to our biology, to the process of evolution, uh, if we don't focus on the process of thinking through decision-making um, quite carefully. 
In addition, secondly, um, those sorts of biases, those kind of hunches, the sort of decision-making by gut is very easily manipulated um, by those who might try to sway us in one direction or another. <clears throat> and therefore, there's a great danger that plebiscitarian democracy doesn't empower the citizens, rather it empowers those people uh, who have power uh, and are able effectively to manipulate us one way or another. And then, in addition, another way in which plebiscitarianism disempowers citizens is that, um, as I said, um, one of the features of plebiscitarianism is the notion that once a government has been elected, that government has a mandate to implement its agenda. Um, and it should be unconstrained in pursuing that agenda. <clears throat> but that supposes that voters read the manifesto. <laughs> and furthermore, agreed with everything in the manifesto. And it is very unlikely that there are any voters, and probably not even the person who wrote the manifesto, is aware of everything in the manifesto and agrees with everything in the manifesto. So the idea that um, an election can give a mandate to deliver an agenda uh, without question, again, is very disempowering because people don't have the opportunity to express views, the genuine opportunity to express views across the range of issues. <clears throat> that leads on to the third point, power without accountability is easily corrupted. Um, so if we imagine a situation in which the executive, the government, is just able to get on with stuff, uh, with on, get on with govern, governing, without being subject to detailed scrutiny by parliament, perhaps by other bodies as well, then it could very easily be corrupted, become lazy, in other ways veer off from genuinely pursuing what might be in the interests of the wider population. <clears throat> Fourthly, um, collective decision making. It says there works better if the people taking part understand each other. So decision making in a democracy is different from decision making in our own private lives. Um, there's some notion that when we go out and vote, uh, we're thinking about what is good for uh, the community as a whole, not just what is good for ourselves. <clears throat> um, and therefore, it's good that we understand each other and we think about the interests of different people within the community. <clears throat> now, a different version of this argument, uh, argument for deliberative democracy, would go stronger than that and would argue that actually what we should be aiming at in a democratic process is consensus. So we should understand each other and understand each other's needs uh, to the extent that we're all able to agree and no longer are there any disagreements among us. Um, I'm not going to attempt to make that argument. That seems to me a bit unrealistic. Uh, in the real world, we're always going to have our own perspectives, uh, um, perspectives our own interests, our own biases. Um, we can't escape them entirely. Uh, and therefore it's not reasonable to expect people to agree with each other. Uh, if you try to impose agreement, the danger is that you just give power to the majority, essentially. So um, collective decision-making, uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting we pursue consensus, uh, but nevertheless, just understanding each other, listening to each other, reflecting with each other is a really important part of the democratic process. And then finally, um, a system with checks and balances can build in protection for minorities. So we need to be concerned that in a democratic system, if the majority always gets its will, uh, that may systematically disadvantage certain groups within society, and we need to ensure that there are protections um, so that that does not happen. So that's my argument for why um, a deliberative approach to democracy is better, and we should care, therefore, about the quality of deliberation, the quality of information, the degree to which we can discuss uh, thoughtfully and caringly among each other, um, and the degree also to which um, uh, power is not uh, held just in a few hands. Power is reasonably widely dispersed, uh, so that um, a range of different people are involved in decision-making. All of that seems to me to be really vitally important in order to have an effective democratic system. So, 
what does that imply about um, better processes for deciding major issues? So by major issues here, I basically mean major constitutional issues. So things like Brexit or coming up, um, potentially there's a, a big decision on Scottish independence. As John mentioned, uh, John and I are working with various others from London, Belfast and Dublin on a working group on unification referendums on the island of Ireland, which entirely neutrally, without taking any view on whether there should be a referendum on that subject, um, is thinking about just what process would be involved uh, if there were a referendum. Um, so again, that's the, that, that, that's the sort of major constitutional issue that I'm thinking about here. Um, <clears throat> so one view is that these sorts of major constitutional issues the experience of Brexit, of a referendum process um, that was very divisive and um, uh, often ill-informed uh, and often very right, aggravated, is that we just shouldn't have referendums. That referendums are inherently plebiscitarian institutions uh, that force people to choose one side or other and then give victory to one side. Um, and in a sense, that's true. Uh, ultimately, a referendum is a, is a majoritarian institution for making a final choice. Um, but it also seems to me inevitable that you have to have referendums on these kinds of issues if they're going to be decided. So if you're going to have a decision-making process relating to these, these issues, it's very difficult to make a case that we should just rely on representative democracy and not allow the, uh, the voters, the citizens, to be engaged directly. Um, in these choices. When we're making fundamental choices about who the people actually are, um, then reference back to the people seems important. So the question here is, well, how can we improve referendums in, in order to get them working better? And I'm going to offer three key principles for how we might improve um, the processes of referendums. So first principle, ooh, the formatting has changed. We'll see how this goes. Um, first principle, wherever possible, referendums should be post-legislative rather than pre-legislative. Um, that is to say that wherever possible, a referendum should be on a concrete proposal that has been worked out in law and specified in detail, rather than a broad principle um, for what might be put into law. Um, because otherwise, you're asking people to vote on something without knowing exactly what it is that they're voting on. And that's rather problematic. Um, sometimes, however, it is difficult to do that. Uh, and sometimes you need to have a pre-legislative referendum on something. So, for example, on the Brexit issue, the EU is never going to start negotiations with the UK on, on the terms of Brexit had there not already been a referendum deciding that we wanted to leave the EU. So sometimes you need to have a referendum on the principle before you work out the detail. Um, <clears throat> I would argue that, consistent with the principles of deliberative democracy that I've just set out, if you're going to do that, then you need to have that referendum as the first step in a double referendum process, where you have first a referendum at the start of the process on the principle, and then a further referendum at the end of the process on um, the detailed terms. Um, otherwise, you're not giving people that chance to offer their informed consent. <coughs> but crucially, you have to set that process out before the first referendum. It's no good promising people in a referendum, we will implement your will in this referendum, and then later saying, well, actually, no, we're going to hold another one. That is violating another democratic principle. Um, I won't say more about this one. Um, but it was argued in quite a lot of detail in a report that came out in July of 2018. Uh, so at the Constitution Unit, we convened an independent commission on referendums, uh, consisting of various leading politicians, uh, people from the media, from academia and elsewhere, to look into the future conduct of referendums in the UK. It inc included leading figures on both sides of the Brexit divide, as well as uh, neutrals and various others. And they um, essentially argued, came to the same conclusion about how to conduct uh, a referendum process. Um, and the, the report is in, on the Constitution Unit website, should you wish to read it. <clears throat>
So that's the first uh, key principle. Second key principle is that um, proposals for a referendum should be subject to detailed prior scrutiny and deliberation. Um, I think that fits pretty clearly with what I've already said, and I'll say a bit more about that um, in just a moment. But before I do so, the third principle um, is that the quality of information available during the referendum campaign should be as high as possible. So the second principle is about the process of deciding to have a referendum. Um, and the third principle is about what you do once you've already made that decision. So I won't say anything more about the first of those. I'll talk in a bit more detail now about the second and then about the third. So the first of those is that prior scrutiny and deliberation is important before you decide to have the referendum. Um, and that's important partly just from a democratic point of view that um, uh, in a referendum, almost all referendums offer people two options. So there's already been a great constraint upon the, the choice that voters, that citizens are able to make in the process of working out what are those two options on the ballot paper. Um, everything else has been excluded from choice. You're only able to choose between those two things. So the process of getting there um, is really important and we ought to care about it. And in addition, as we've seen from the Brexit referendum, a referendum can be an incredibly divisive, difficult and enormously influential event. So it's really important to think through carefully uh, before you decide to have one, that it's really a good idea and really important to work out um, what the implications of the options on the ballot paper might be if either of them was adopted. So essentially, I think there are two uh, recognised mechanisms of having this kind of uh, detailed prior scrutiny and deliberation. Um, the first is conventional parliamentary scrutiny, so scrutiny taking place within the legislature, and the second is to have some kind of citizens' assembly process. So parliamentary scrutiny is, as I said, more familiar, more standard. We might expect it to have happened before the Brexit referendum. It was entirely absent before the Brexit referendum. So there was no serious thought um, about, is this referendum actually a good idea? What effects might it have upon society? Um, so Parliament debated in quite a, uh, some detail the process of the referendum, what the franchise should be, what the wording of the question should be, all sorts of details about the campaign rules. But they didn't think about, well, what actually would Brexit be like? Uh, what would be involved? What would be the process of Brexit? And what would be the end point of Brexit? There was no debate about that in Parliament. There was no attempt in Parliament, or indeed in government, to define the kind of Brexit that might be pursued if that's what people voted for. This seems to me an extraordinary dereliction of duty on the part of our MPs. Um, and I think that is something that can genuinely be agreed and is genuinely agreed by people on both sides of the Brexit divide. Um, certainly our independent commission on referendums had uh, Gisela Stewart as one of its members. Uh, she was chair of Vote Leave. And she has gone on record several times since the re re referendum saying that referendum should not have happened in the form it did. It was outrageous that people were forced to make that choice when there were potentially better options available in terms of a reformed EU or, or a reformed relationship with the EU, something of that kind. Now, she may be right, she may be wrong on that. People will disagree. But it's quite striking that a person who won the referendum thinks that that referendum should not have taken place. Um, but we didn't have that process before the referendum at all. Um, it's also worth noting the example of how referendums are done in Switzerland. So Switzerland, of course, is the country that has more referendums than any other on the planet. Um, and the Swiss tend to be pretty happy with how they do referendums and quite kind of proud that we have popular power uh, and that voters are really to, able to have their say. What's often not recognised is that the Swiss referendum process is one in which the Swiss parliament is very deeply involved. So um, voters are able to call a referendum through petition in Switzerland, um, but that then goes to parliament, and parliament scrutinises the proposal. Parliament is able to offer a counter-proposal 
Uh, so it might say, okay, we recognize that um, there's, there's, there's a point to the, the proposal that is being put forward here, but we don't think it's quite the right proposal, so here's something that would be a bit better, and then both of those proposals are put to voters in the referendum. So um, Parliament is deeply involved in scrutinizing things, even when it's a citizen-initiated referendum in Switzerland. And I think we could potentially learn quite a lot from that kind of case. On the other hand, Parliament isn't perfect. Um, so Parliament, Parliament's struggle to be genuinely deliberative institutions if part of deliberation is being open-minded. So deliberation is about listening to each other and reflecting with each other. But we need also to be able, if we're going to deliberate pro properly, to change our minds if the other arguments that we hear are persuasive to us. It's really difficult for politicians to change their minds. Partly just because of the nature of our political culture uh, that is hostile to the ideas that politicians might ever be weak and changing your mind is a sign of weakness. Um, but partly also because fundamentally in a representative system, if you're elected on a platform to do various things, now I said we have to be a bit careful of, of, of saying that that platform has incredible strength and gives you a really strong mandate, but at the same time, if you're elected on a platform to do various things and you say later, actually, I've changed my mind. No, I don't think that's a good idea anymore. Um, that's quite problematic for the representative relationship. And if politicians were doing that all the time, it would be a bit difficult. So <clears throat> it can be difficult for politicians to deliberate properly, which means they can get caught up in the partisan battle where they're on one side or the other side and they're not really able to reflect uh, uh, openly on the, the views that they're hearing from the other side. In addition, um, trust in politicians and parliaments and so on is, as we all know, very, very low. Um, and therefore, just having a parliamentary process uh, leading up to a referendum isn't necessarily going to bolster public confidence in that process. So that's where citizens' assemblies come in. It's sometimes said, well, we have a citizens' assembly. We just call it parliament. Um, <clears throat> but actually... Parliaments, for the reasons I've given, have their weaknesses. They're, I mean, they're really important, and I'm not suggesting we cut them out, but they have their weaknesses. So citizens' assemblies offer an additional way of bringing citizens into politics and encouraging a deliberative process to politics. So many of you will be familiar with citizens' assemblies already. They've been most prominent in the Republic of Ireland, um, most notably on the issues of same-sex marriage and abortion, though they've looked at other issues as well. <coughs> So, as you know, randomly selected group of citizens who come together over a period of time, typically several weekends, uh, learn in detail about some, some, some issue, discuss it in depth, and come to conclusions. Um, they're increasingly happening in the UK as well. Um, so, most prominently, there's currently a Citizens' Assembly of Scotland looking at a number of issues to do with the future of Scotland. The UK Parliament has just announced a Citizens' Assembly on climate change to think about how the UK might um, achieve its uh, um, net zero carbon emissions target by 2050. Um, and there are various other citizens' assemblies ha happening in all parts of the UK. Northern Ireland has, has its own citizens' assembly organised by civil society groups um, a little while back as well. So um, they're now happening quite widely, um, but it's a really important question to ask, well, could a citizens' assembly really work in the UK on a really big con controversial constitutional question? Um, citizens' assemblies have often been used on issues um, that are less polarizing when there aren't already strongly entrenched uh, views on the issue. Um, if, it's, if they're going to work for constitutional, big constitutional questions, they have to um, get beyond um, those bounds. So I shall say a few words about a citizens' assembly that, um, as John said at the start, I uh, was in charge of, um, though I had a wonderful team of people helping. Um, so that was the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit, which took place in September of 2017. And so this was an assembly, it was quite, an, quite a small Citizens' Assembly, so it only had 50 members, our funding was limited, uh, but randomly selected uh, from the UK electorate as a whole. 
Um, it met over two weekends in Manchester in autumn 2017. I should say it was, it was organised by us and, and it was an academic project. Um, so it was funded by the, the academic funder, the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, it was not, therefore, a, a government project. It wasn't linked directly into politics, though um, there was quite a lot of interest in it uh, from MPs in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords as well. So it met over two weekends in Manchester. It looked at the question of what kind of Brexit members wanted, focusing particularly on trade policy and migration policy. So it wasn't asking the question of whether Brexit should happen. We said to the members, uh, the referendum has happened. The UK government is now seeking to negotiate the terms of Brexit. The purpose of this is to, of, of the Citizens' Assembly, is to inform those negotiations. Um, and to in encourage the UK government uh, to think about uh, what people want uh, in terms of the form of Brexit. At that time, the division between the first and second um, uh, stages of Brexit, the negotiation of withdrawal and then the future relationship, was still just being negotiated. So the fact that those became so separate wasn't yet quite clear. Uh, so what we actually focused on were future relationship issues that haven't been negotiated yet, but nevertheless they're very interesting relating to trade and to migration policy. So two weekends, as I said, first weekend was what we called the learning phase, when members of the Assembly learnt from various experts on these issues and from each other, and they really enjoyed engaging with each other and hearing from people whom they wouldn't normally discuss politics with. Um, and then the second weekend, uh, which was uh, the deliberation and decision, fa decision phase, they were able to discuss in detail among themselves and finally reach decisions. Um, and all of this was designed and supported by the best facilitators, best expert facilitators um, from an organisation called Involve. So, in case you haven't seen a citizens' assembly, who's, who's seen a citizens' assembly in, in, in action? A good gaggle at the back of the room. Uh, okay, so a few pictures of citizens' assemblies for the rest of you. So um, this is basically what it looks like. So you have the various members who are arranged around small round tables, um, because a lot of the discussions happen in round tables. Um, at, the, at this point, they're listening to the lead facilitator at the front of the room setting out what's going to happen. A few minutes later, they had the misfortune to listen to me uh, when I had less hair. <coughs> um, they also... Uh, heard from a range of experts on Brexit. If you've been following the Brexit debate, you might recognise Anand Menon um, from King's College London, uh, Catherine Barnard from Cambridge, and various other experts there. Uh, but as I said, most of the work happens in small groups, so about eight or seven or eight members with a facilitator uh, on tables. So the facilitators are the people in green T-shirts. So there they're just kind of getting to know each other. They're all still looking quite polite. Um, here they're beginning to get a bit more serious. Uh, so the facilitator is not wearing a t-shirt for, for, for some reason, but she's the person with the red hair. Um, we also had note takers, which is why there's someone with a laptop there. Um, so they're beginning to get into it there. It's getting really intense. Uh, facilitator's having to stand up. Um, but it's also really important that they're not always just talking with each other, because if you did that, then it would be quite easy for the people who formulate their thoughts most quickly and, and speak uh, first to uh, kind of dominate the discussion. So it's really important to give everyone time just to reflect and think for themselves. Um, so so some, some important time was spent doing that. Uh, so they would write on post-it notes and then um, in many different ways they could uh, share um, their thoughts uh, with people on the table. Um, and then uh, this is an example of where they're... Um, they're comparing different thoughts and, and putting on stickers for the th thoughts that they think are more important and that they want to be considered further. And then we went through a process uh, where we uh, gathered those thoughts and, and formed some kind of grouping of, of, of the different thoughts uh, that uh, were in the room. Um, it's important to mention that the experts are not just kind of standing at the front like me at the moment, um, pontificating to the masses, uh, but that they really engage with um, uh, the members as well. So they go onto the tables and the members of the assembly often particularly valued the time when the, the uh, experts actually got down there and they could really properly quiz the experts. Um, 
And then finally, uh, as I said, we weren't seeking consensus, so issues were decided ultimately um, by voting. And there's the ballot box at the back of the room. So that's what a citizens' assembly uh, looks like. That's the kind of process that is involved. The citizens' assembly on Brexit um, asked the members to consider a number of questions. So uh, first of all, we asked them to think about what do you want to be able to value about the country in which you live? Um, it was a good way to kind of warm them up and get them thinking about uh, the issues that matter to them and also uh, often to see that um, people who are very different from, from them actually value the same things quite often. Uh, and they could hear a range of perspectives. Then we asked them to complete the sentences, UK trade policy should dot, 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 and UK migration policy should dot, dot, dot. So think about what policy should be aiming to, to achieve. And then we looked at options for trade policy, trade policy with the, EU, with the EU, beyond the EU, and then also options for migration policy. So I'll very quickly just give you a flavour for um, the sorts of outcomes that the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit came up with, just again to give you a flavour of um, what, a, what an assembly in this kind of area might be able to do. And I have to apologise for a sudden change of, of slide format, because um, uh, I have the results uh, in, a different, in the Citizens' Assembly format rather than the Constitution Unit format. So the first thing was, what do you want to be able to value about the country in which you live? Um, and these were the things that people came up with. So very broad range of very general values. So it's just a useful starting point um, for people as they think about uh, the issues before them. Then we moved on to the policy guidelines. Uh, so UK trade policy should do these things. Minimise harm to the economy, protect the NHS and public services, maintain living standards, take account of impacts on all parts of the UK, protect workers' rights, avoid a hard border with Ireland. Um, now, we should remember this was in September 2017. Great Britain had not yet noticed Ireland <laughs> uh, and that there might be difficulties on the border uh, with, with at least some forms of Brexit. Uh, so it's quite striking that a citizens' assembly process did... Uh, it became quite, a, quite an important thing for, for the members of the assembly when it just wasn't in wider UK discourse. Um, and UK migration policy should do these things, be linked to investment and training, better data on migrants, enable us to sustain public services, better benefit our economy, be responsive to regional needs, and include better planning of public services. So with these kinds of ideas in mind about what they wanted policy options to advance, then the members were able to start thinking about policy options, uh, starting with trade with the European Union, um, so we presented four options that people might look at. Uh, so all the way from staying in the single market through comprehensive trade deal, more limited trade deal, to no trade deal with the EU at all. Uh, and they had lots of detailed discussion of these and were then able to vote on them. Um, so this is how the, the members' first preferences distributed across those four options. So plurality for a limited trade deal uh, but of course you never quite know when there are four options and there's uh, no, no one with a clear majority as to what would people prefer in different scenarios. So we did ask them to rank the options in order of preference. And then we can look, for example, at if you give points. So if you say three points for first preference, two points for second, one point for third, none for coming last. Then the comprehensive trade deal option kind of emerges maybe as a bit of a compromise uh, 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 option among those. You can also consider, well, what happens if some of these options turn out not to be possible? So if the UK just can't negotiate a comprehensive trade deal, uh, as, it, as it might like, uh, what would people then prefer? Um, so it turned out that they would prefer, they would still prefer to have the advantage of Brexit in terms of greater sovereignty, having greater control um, by having um, a limited trade deal rather than staying in the single market. Um, but very little support for a no trade deal option. And then if we exclude the possibility of any kind of bespoke trade deal, then interestingly, they went for the single market over a no trade deal at all. If you look at how we trade with countries beyond the EU, so we framed that, this essentially in terms of what do we do with our relationship with the customs union. Three options, stay in it, 
have a wonderful world in which we have a special customs deal that maintains perfectly frictionless borders with the EU and gives us the right to uh, conduct our own trade negotiations with countries outside the EU, or option C, no customs deal with the EU. Surprise, surprise, people like having their cake and, cake and eating it. So, um, so that option came out first. But of course, and if you look at points, then it's just the same. But, um, but the advantage of this kind of pro approach is that you can really get people to think, OK, that might be your ideal, but what would you prefer if you can't get it? What would you prefer if the British government can't negotiate that? And interestingly, um, they preferred staying in the customs union. Um, if that was the way to maintain frictionless borders. And again, their concern about the Irish border was quite important here. Then finally, um, options for uh, UK, uh, EU migration. Uh, so here things got quite complicated. We added an option um, uh, after the first weekend in response to feedback from the members. I won't go through those in detail, but interestingly, a clear majority um, preferred maintaining free, move, pre free movement of labour while using the restrictions that are available within the terms of the single market in order to prevent what they saw as um, a, a migration that was harmful to the UK, economically harmful to the UK. And that's it if you look at points as well. So um, I should uh, wrap up fairly soon. So uh, let me uh, just uh, draw out some conclusions from that. So the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit was highly successful within itself in that um, it achieved equal participation. So um, uh, we had equal numbers of men and women, for example. And furthermore, there was no difference in how much they participated in the discussions, similarly with members of ethnic minorities and so on. Um, that participation was a pretty high quality, so people did listen to each other, engage with each other, reflect. Um, and they came up with coherent conclusions in the sense that, uh, given their underlying values and principles, the outcomes make sense. Um, I've also put in brackets that there were moderate conclusions, which um, you might think a good thing or not a good thing, but it's some, there's sometimes a concern that, well, if you give power to the people, they might be wacky and they might decide crazy things. And there's no evidence that that is actually what happens. On the other hand, Citizens' Assembly was largely ignored by the world outside. Um, so politicians did not pay much attention. Now, that's partly because we did it. It wasn't a, a politician's uh, exercise. Um, so it's important to engage politicians in this kind of process. In the first Irish Assembly, the Constitutional Convention, politicians were actually members of that body. Um, that creates all sorts of problems. But there are other ways in which you can ensure that politicians are engaged. They commission the thing. Um, they come along. They observe it. They uh, present and so on. And secondly, citizens' assemblies work better when opinions are not already polarised and entrenched. So when we held our citizens' assembly, it was already the case that the referendum had happened. Politicians had um, decided what they thought. The members of the assembly were very open-minded and happy to engage. Um, wider politicians, less so. Um, now, given that I'm running out of time, um, I was going to talk a bit about information during campaigns, which was problematic during the campaign, the referendum campaign, on both sides. This is nonsense from the Re Remain campaign, or at least dubious stuff from the Remain campaign. Um, read the report in order to find out what I might say about that. Uh, we, that report is also on the Constitution Unit uh, website. So, some implications for democracy in the UK. So I've been talking mainly about implications for how we do big constitutional decisions. Um, it's also important to think about um, implications for the conduct of day-to-day -day politics. As I said at the start, plebiscitarian democracy won the, ref the election last month. Not just get Brexit done, but also a wider agenda of constitutional reform that seems to be aiming at um, removing the shackles on government so that government can do whatever it wants and parliament and the courts and others are constrained in their ability to impose limits upon that power. Um, from the viewpoint of uh, deliberative democracy, we should just keep an eye on this stuff, I think. We should, it's not entirely clear what the government is planning, but we should keep a careful eye on it. 
Um, in terms, so, so for implications for conduct of day-to-day -day politics, um, we should remember the importance of having multiple power centres. Um, we should celebrate the fact that uh, um, citizens' assemblies are being used uh, and hope that that happens rather more. Um, and that will be a useful way of getting people used to the idea of citizens' assemblies, uh, which might then make it easier to hold them on some of the big issues. So, as I said, um, big constitutional uh, decisions have been made, might be made in the near future. Brexit, Scottish independence, the future of Northern Ireland. Um, <clears throat> on Brexit, it strikes me that uh, it would have been very interesting had David Cameron uh, said when he announced the referendum, not I'm going to have a referendum on our membership of the EU, but I'm going to hold a citizens' assembly uh, that really looks into the issues of why are people unhappy with the EU at the moment? Um, what would best address that unhappiness? Which might be leaving, or it might be reforming the EU, or it might be changing how, how we treat our membership of the EU. Uh, all of these things were possible. We could have had a very interesting process there. Uh, now, however, uh, views are, are, are clearly very polarised, and I mean, obviously, Brexit is now going to happen. The future of that debate is very uncertain. On Scottish independence, um, so we've already had the polarising event on Scottish independence. We've already had the referendum. It's quite difficult to pull things back from that um, and develop now a more deliberative process. But of course, the Scottish government would like to have another referendum. Um, I've been trying to persuade it that it should have a double referendum process. Um, it's not biting yet, but you never know. I think there are actually good arguments from their point of view why it would be in their interest as well. But um, I think there is, there's still scope to make the process more deliberative than it was in the 2014 referendum. There are still possibilities for using citizens' assemblies in that process, despite the, the polarisation on the big question. Um, but it's not going to be straightforward. So it's far easier to have a referendum earlier in the process rather than later. Future of Northern Ireland, you all know much more about that than I do, so I will not say anything. Uh, and also, as, as I said, we're at the start of the process of our working group thinking about how a process there might be designed. So I shall be very interested in your thoughts. Thank you very much.